Okay guys, so in this video uh, we're going to continue our discussion on non-equivalent resonance structures. The issue that we closed the previous video with was the idea that if a molecule can be represented by many non-equivalent resonance structures, which of the resonance structures would be the best one? When you have non-equivalent resonance structures, getting the real structure is not as simple as taking an average of all the non-equivalent resonance structures. It turns out that usually one or two of the resonance structures are more representative of your experimental structure than some of the other ones. In other words, you have 10 of them, maybe one or two are actually more correct, and the other eight are really, really not uh, good at all as a representation of the real structure. So in this video, we would discuss how to pick our best structure out of all the different resonance structures we can draw. And we would do this by using a set of rules based on formal charges. So what are these rules to pick the best resonance structure? I listed them here, and they're also on your lecture slide. And I'm going to go through uh, each one of them at a time, and then we're going to go through an example to actually compare resonance structures and then pick the best one. Okay, so the first one is to make sure that the best resonance structures always has formal charges of each atom being close to zero. Okay, so you really want zero if possible, but a lot of times you can't make them go to zero regardless of any way you draw the Lewis structure, so you end up getting non-zero formal charges. If that's the case, then you want the smaller formal charges on the atoms. Okay, so if you can draw a resonance structure where you get one of the atoms to be negative one as opposed to negative two, then the negative one will be better. And if you get positive one versus positive two, then positive one will be better. Okay. Last rule is that a lot of times you're going to end up with negative formal charges. If you do end up with negative formal charges, then you want to make sure that the negative formal charge actually resides on the more electronegative atom. Okay, let's do an example of this. And we're going to go back to our ion that we've been working with a few times now, which is the bromide ion. And I'm going to draw three or four different resonance structures, and then we can go through the rules to select the best one out of four, okay? in front of us now four different resonance structures of BRO3 and three of these we already actually discussed in the previous video we drew them and we calculated formal charges for the, for all of these structures and those are structures A, B, and C and now I added one more which is structure D okay I'm just going to put the formal charges right now on A, B, C and then we'll calculate it very quickly for D okay so if you look at these three structures A, B, C I put in the formal charges that we calculated earlier and then for D I just did a quick calculation of the formal charges and you see that all the three oxygens have formal charges of zero and then the bromine has formal charge of negative one okay the bromine here has more than octet uh, of electrons but we said that it's okay because bromine is in the uh, fourth period so it's fine to have uh, more than eight electrons around the central atom around the bromine in this case okay so the next question then is if it's okay for bromine to violate the octet rule that means all of these structures are reasonable lowest structures the question is which one is the best one which one would be most representative of our experimental structure well, that's when we use these rules that I just talked about, okay? First rule is you want to pick the one that is closest to zero for all the atoms, okay? Now, if you look carefully here, automatically we would exclude structure A, okay? That's not good because, as you can see in that particular structure, all the atoms actually have a formal charge, and BR actually has a formal charge of plus two. So that's really terrible because you, ideally you want all of them to be zero if you can, okay? So that is terrible. Now, it's actually interesting in this case to point out that structure is the worst structure in terms of formal charge, but in terms of the octet rule, actually structure A is really good because all the oxygen has octet and the bromine also has octet in this case, right? It has one, two, three, and four. Uh, pairs of electron okay so we would discuss this at the end of this video to talk about which rule should dominate should the octet rule dominate or should the formal charge rule dominate but in this case it's pretty clear that structure a is not good it's bad we don't want it okay this is by formal charge is a really terrible one okay if you look at the other three it's clear that B is also not as good as the other two and the reason being in this case that in B, you have three atoms having formal charges, whereas in C and D, only one of the atoms has formal charge, whereas the other three are zeros. Okay, so we would, basically, our top contenders here is either C or D. Now we have to look at the other rules to see if we can pick a better one out of C or D. 
If we go to the second one, it says smaller formal charge are better than bigger formal charge. If you go back to C and D, they both have negative 1 uh, and the other three are 0. So that rule doesn't really help us distinguish which one is the better one. If you go to rule number 3, it says negative formal charge should be on the more electronegative atom. So if you go back here, we see that on structure C, the, electro, uh, the negative formal charge resides on oxygen. All right, it's right here. Whereas in structure D, the negative formal charge resides on bromine. Okay. Now, which one is the more electronegative atom? If you look through the periodic table, you find that oxygen is the more electronegative atom. So, in this case, we've now concluded, using all our three rules, that structure C is the best structure. Now, again, what do I mean by best? Best here means that it's the one that would represent the experimental structure the most. In other words, it will be the closest to the experimental structure. Does that mean that structure D, some of the features of structure D, is not present? Of course not. Structure D is not a terrible structure. It's fairly reasonable. Okay? If I were to guess, I would say maybe 70% of the experimental structure is represented by structure C, and then maybe the other 20% is structure D, and then the rest of them is a mixture of A, B, and other resonance structures that you can draw. Okay? Is that clear? So that's the way you're going to reason out the best structure out of non-equivalent resonance structure. Let's do another example of picking the best structure. So here's SCN minus. I'm going to quickly calculate the valence. It's going to be 6 plus 4 plus 5 plus 1, which gives us 16 electrons. Okay. Now, you have to think back to the Lewis model, and remember that the least electronegative atom is usually a central atom, so carbon is the central atom in this case. So you can have it this way. In some cases, actually, sulfur might also be the central atom. So, but in this case, we're talking about there's two different ions, SCN being the first one. So we want to do 16 electrons in this case, right? So if you calculate and, you know, make sure that you have enough electrons for everybody and make sure that everybody has a tet, they'll be the first structure you can draw. But as you can see, it's fairly easy for me to just move one of the pairs of electrons to make a structure that looks like this, for example. And I'm not violating the octet rule at this point. Everybody still has octet. And if I do, let's say, the opposite case, I still uh, fulfill octet rule without violating any one of them. But, there, you know, again, that's another good structure that I can draw, right? a structure that basically satisfies the octet rule. So I have three different non-equivalent resonance structures. Now you can imagine that you can draw more, but then these are basically three of the most reasonable ones. Okay. Again, in one of these cases, you want to be able to figure out which one would be the best structure. In that case, you want to go ahead and calculate formal charges. I'm going to do it for you real quick. If you do the formal charge calculation, you'll see that uh, structure A, resonance structure A, has 0, 0, and negative 1 on the end. Structure B has plus 1, 0, and negative 2, and then structure C has negative on the S and 0, 0. Now, going back to those rules again, to differentiate between the structure, hopefully you can clearly see that the one that I really don't like here is which one? It would be structure B, right? So that's the terrible one, because that one uh, has uh, formal charges on two atoms, the other two only has formal charges on one of the atoms. And then you compare A and C, you see, now, the better one in this case would be structure A. And it's not because it has two double bonds or anything of that sort. The reason here is because the formal charge is located on nitrogen, which is a more electronegative atom than sulfur. Okay? Sulfur is less electronegative than nitrogen. So based on rule number three in our formal charge decision-making process, we would pick structure A as our best structure in this case. Okay? Again, I don't want you to think that in that case, the structure C doesn't contribute to our experimental structure. It probably does, but it's to a smaller percentage. Okay? So now I want to discuss the last point about formal charges differentiating resonance structures uh, and picking the best one. And this is, at this point, we just talked about two examples where basically in one case, we just ignore the octet rule. We say that the elements can violate the octet, octet rule, that's when we're talking about bromine, so we say that it's okay to have all these drawings even when they violate the octet rule, but then we went by the formal charge rule in this case. But in some cases, like this one, we say we need to obey the octet rule. 
So then the question is, which rule is more important? Do we always have to follow the octet rule? Or do we always have to follow the formal charge rule? Which one dominates? Remember that anything that's on the second period or below, right, has to follow the octet rule, okay? Because the reason is because they don't have these d orbitals that allow them to violate the octet rule. So when you're drawing molecules that only have atoms on second period or below, then they have to satisfy octet rule. Okay. So in other words, when you're drawing all your different resonance structures, all the different resonance structures have to follow octet rule. You can't violate octet rule for these atoms. However, once you're talking about third period or beyond, right, these elements can violate the octet rule. So then you would draw all kinds of structure. Draw everything, right? And what I mean by everything here is basically they can be the either octet or non-octet, right? Because they can violate the octet rule in this case. And just pick the best one using formal charge, okay? So that's the way you would use guidelines, okay? Anything that's second period or below, follow the octet rule. All resonance structures have to follow octet rule. Third or beyond, they can get more electrons, more than eight. But in the end, to pick the best one, you have to go with formal charge. You don't worry about octet. All right? Okay, so that's the last of our resonance video.